don't know if you've noticed, but with each passing day, with each passing session, the music goes on just a little longer. And that's the way we like it. But even James Brown, and yes, I gave it away because we already have a winner, is worth interrupting for this next discussion. I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the conference chair for streaming media. And I'm also the chief marketing officer at Ideas. And welcome to the second session of the third day of the 10th Streaming Media Connect virtual event. We will be back in person for Streaming Media East in Boston, May 18th and 19th with the Content Delivery Summit and Streaming Media University Workshops on May 17th. Steve, our intrepid producer and the editor of Streaming Media has just pasted the links in the chat. So you can check out those events after the discussion, of course. Uh, and uh, the programs for both of those events will be going online very soon as well. The sooner you register, the better deal you can get. So check that out soon. Before we jump into our discussion, a couple of housekeeping notes. Y'all know we've got the Name That Tune thing going on. We already have a winner for this session. Assuming that winner sticks around until the end, you must be present to win that $50 Amazon gift card you get for correctly identifying the name uh, of the artist and the song, both uh, first in the chat. You may notice that there are subtitles or captions running across the bottom of your screen. If that's the case and you don't want them there, just go to the bottom of your Zoom screen and click hide captions and that will turn them off. Finally, all of these sessions from this week and previous streaming media events are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, or you can just go to streamingmedia.com, click on videos, and click on conference videos. I'd like to thank Signiant for sponsoring all three days of Streaming Media Connect, and we have a brief video message from them now. Wherever content needs to flow, the Signiant platform can move any size file over any IP network. At speeds, it can be up to 100 times faster than traditional transfer methods. More than 50,000 businesses use the Signiant platform to send and share files, automate movement of data between systems, exchange content with global partners, and move content to and from the cloud. The Signiant platform gives you the power to operate at the speed you need to run your business. And I'd also like to thank Applicaster for sponsoring this session. And in fact, Applicaster's Jonathan Leor will be joining the panel, which will be led by the also intrepid Evan Shapiro. If you follow digital media at all on LinkedIn, you know that Evan is one of the voices that is absolutely crucial to understanding both the big picture and the details. And so with that, I'm just going to turn the mic and the camera over to him. Evan, take it away. Thanks so much, Eric. Thanks for having me today. Uh, my panelists will turn on their cameras and mics as well. I'll introduce them really quickly. Um, today, uh, I don't know how they're lined up on your screen, but they're going clockwise for me this way. Matt Farina is the Senior Vice President of Content Distri Distribution at NBC Universal, and we'll talk about what he get, uh, does on a daily basis in a little bit. Amanda Lotz is a brilliant author, consultant, professor at um, the uh, Research Center in Brisbane, uh, Australia, and her most recent book, uh, Media Disrupted, is a must-read. It kind of tracks why we are where we are today, not kind of, it exactly tracks why we are where we are today. Philippe Guiton, uh, who is the Chief Revenue Officer for Chicken Soup uh, for the Soul Entertainment and Crackle uh, and a bunch of other uh, properties over there. I'm going to ask him what a Chief Revenue Officer does in this moment of time in media. I think we're all open to that. Jonathan Leor, as previously mentioned, is the CEO, founder, and president of Applicaster, the only no low code platform uh, for creating and launching and managing your apps on multiple uh, devices and tech stacks. And uh, Smriti Sharma, who's the head of Consumer Insights at Publishers <laughs> Clearinghouse. Um, and um, she and I work together on a number of different uh, surveys and white papers around the minds of the modern streaming consumer uh, in the last six months. And a lot of panels will focus on the how the company is approaching the, the moment in time that media is having right now. Um, but just for a, a couple of seconds, I want to spend some time and look at some of the results of the surveys um, that Publishers Clearinghouse and I have done um, over the last six months with regard specifically on how consumers see the streaming market right now. Um, and I think w one of the things that's most interesting is how many people are willing still at this moment in time to pay for content. And we talk about fast and free and AVOD uh, and a number of other inputs, but 
and especially younger people, 64% of people under the age of 45 are willing to pay for their content. Even over 55, where it starts to go down for a number of different reasons, 50, near 50% 50 are willing to pay. On the economic standpoint, the more money a household has um, right now, they're, they are more willing to pay for content. Um, but even at the lower end of the economic scale, for households with $35,000 or less in income, 48% say they're still willing to pay for certain content. And then when we ask them, uh, these consumers, so this is based on uh, 19,000 surveys um, last fall. This is based on 27,000 respondents um, this past January. We ask how consumers want their media. And this really deals with the moment in time that uh, streaming television is going through. 31% say they want free with max ads or fast, I guess we would call it. 31% say they want paid with no ads. So the pure Netflix model. And some say, you know, a mix of both. And then when you ask them further what they are going to do in the year ahead with regards to mixing pay and free and ads and subscriptions, 36 say pay less and get more ads. 23% say pay more and get uh, less ads. And then 41% say depends. Depends on what mood I'm in, the content, the platform. Um, and then taking this a step further, we ask what's your intention with your subscription media over the year ahead? Only 7%, and this is for video, audio, gaming, news, um, kids programming, um, only 7% of all consumers out of 27,000 asked said that they would stick with the current slate of subscription services they have right now, with the rest giving some sort of, I'm going to see what happens on a month-by-month -month basis, I'm going to cut back to the bare minimum, probably for economic reasons, I'm going to subscribe to less and then switch as needed. And then lastly, just in case you're thinking, all right, well, I'll just change the password settings on my service and force people to subscribe to more and not share with their kids and family. When said, what happens if your service uh, limits password sharing? Only 9% of consumers said, I'll add more subscriptions rather than cut the service. 56% said they've reduced the use of the service. And 35% said somehow they're going to work around that password lockdown. So that's a lot of input, but I think it kind of frames where the consumer is going into the second half of first quarter in 2023 as the media is reporting its earnings. And I would say generally seemingly struggle with struggling with the modern model that fits the modern consumer really well. Um, Smriti, I'm, con I'm uh, interested, you know, you've been with me interviewing all these consumers for the last six months. What's your big takeaway when you, when you think about the nearly 80,000 uh, responses have gotten from the consumers in the last six months? Yeah, I think um, some of the biggest take takeaways were, you know, that the fact that everybody believed that people are not willing to pay for ad or they don't want to watch ads or they don't want to play, uh, pay for media, I think that's wrong. They are willing to pay. They are also willing to see ads. Um, and I think, you know, you've said that uh, across all media, it's not just audio, TV, sports, news, gaming. I mean, every, and it's not based on household income and it's not based on age group. People are willing to see ads. People are willing to pay for media. I think you said it perfectly right. It will, it depends. It depends on what they are getting. What's the value of it? What's what the content is being watched, right? So that's one of the biggest takeaways that I take it from there. It opens the eyes of the streaming services as to how to, how to change their business model to, to satisfy the consumer in that need. The other thing was also the fact that you know, across all demos, income, content preferences, price sensitivities, one big headlines was 93% of the media subs are at risk every month. That, you know, 27,000 people that we interviewed said that only 7% intend to stay with the current media services. That doesn't mean that 93% of subscribers will cancel every month. It just means they are going to think about canceling every month. So what are the streaming services going to do to make them stay with them and retain the lifetime value? I think they, those are really good um, areas in which you know, streaming services will have to think and think from the consumer's end as to how to keep the cons consumers with them. Yeah. Uh, so, so Matt, that's that's I a uh, really great insight, and um, and I think really a good a gr again a great framing for this larger conversation. Um, Matt, um, when you think about 
So, so Peacock started with a major free offering for pretty much everything. And then recently you moved to, for new subscribers, it's going to be all paid, but varying prices with ads, right? That's the, that's the basic strategy moving forward. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, so a, you know, what do you, how do you think Peacock in particular is positioned given all of the inputs from the consumers that we just saw? And then when you think of NBC's distribution, NBC Universal's distribution strategy writ large across all the properties that you're offering, how do you feel like the company is situated with regards to this, this kind of very complex um, set of, you know, points of view that the consumers are bringing to the table? Yeah, I think, you know, I think, I think NBC Universal is in a really sort of unique and, and really good position. You know, when I think about, you know, those pages and those insights that you just threw up on the screen, you know, what's clear, I think, is that consumers still really want access to professionally produced content, but the distribution model has changed, right? So for us, you know, our sort of mandate or our goal is to be as widely distributed as possible on the platforms that consumers are watching TV on. Um, and for us, you know, I think we have all the pieces, right? We have a very healthy, um, scaled, traditional pay TV ecosystem that we still distribute our content on and still value those partnerships and relationships. And there's a lot of people watching content on those on that platform. Uh, but for folks who are interested in watching in a bit of a different way, more on demand, uh, you know, we have a direct to consumer offer and, and Peacock is I think really positioned because we have this sort of dual revenue model where there's a subscription fee, but also an ad fee. Um, and I think Peacock's thriving because I, uh, you know, and you're seeing some of our, our peers and contemporaries sort of follow suit now with the ad supported model. And I think that's really largely driven by, you know, in order to sort of sustain the premium content model, you know, uh, the, the dual revenue model, I think is really um, where we need to be. And then, and then lastly, you know, for folks that just want to lean back sort of more casual experience, uh, we have a fast and ABOT business, right? And I think for us, that's really interesting because now we have content getting a second, third, and fourth window behind its initial release. So, you know, again, I think we're really in a good position. And I think, you know, uh, we've got a lot of the great pieces and now we're kind of pulling it all together with these great distribution partners and, and platforms that we're working with. Um, Philippe, you, you, you're the other publisher on this on this panel here. And, and unlike NBC Universal, which started basically with one set of linear properties that they kind of built everything out from, you've, you know, started actually with an AVOD property in Crackle, um, and then really built around that. Um, I'm, I'm interested, and I've actually talked to you and your CEO about this in the past, but like, and, and I know that some of it is opportunistic, but realistically, when you talk about the stack that you have from everything from Crackle to Redbox, um, to, to everything in, and the TVOD that you have in between, how do you see your stack? How do you talk about your stack? And then how do you see it positioned in the same ecosystem that, that Matt was just talking about, where the consumers have a kind of really wide, widely varied set of inputs based on a monthly basis? Yeah, I think the way we talk about it is really all those consumer touch points that we have and providing viewers uh, options uh, to watch content in many different ways, different formats, um, different times, at different prices as well, so that they can choose uh, when and where to watch Avatar, for example. You know, it will come soon on our DVD uh, rental business and then all our TVOD uh, platform and then, you know, AVOD will be much down, you know, much later. But um, we we want to serve the especially value conscious consumers. You know, we're not in the SVOD business. That's actually the only model probably that we don't have uh, today. But you but, sell you sell to the SVOD players. But, so we do as you know all our content because we have a studio business. You know, we have a movie and, and TV distribution business, uh, and we have our own platforms. Obviously, consumer facing platforms. We have, as you said, uh, Ava platforms, um, but Redbox is really interesting because it brought us at once, you know, additional uh, channels like Fast. You know, we have a Fast platform with over 160 uh, channels, uh, both ours and third-party channels, and TVOD, which uh, is really a way to uh, to provide consumers an early peek at content right before it gets to uh, SVOD even platforms. And it's a great way to attract consumers too because they see the amazing. So that's movie. ad free. You buy the it, you buy the it, you film know, itself, buy it. kind of traditional model. But interestingly, for example, on this one, we may have some movie, movies where we have both AVOD and TVOD rights, and we offer both up, you know options uh, to consumers. And guess what? It actually increases the TVOD rentals because 
you know, consumers can actually um, uh, sample the content on the AVOT side. You know, they have to commit right away and buy the movie. And then as like it, they actually switch and say, all right, let's buy it and, and kill the ads for the for the next, you know, hour or so. Um, and then, of course, the, uh, the red box kiosks, um, you know, a lot of people were wondering, well, why would you want to rent DVDs these days? And uh, and I would say on on top of um, serving certain communities of viewers who, you know, need that. Um, uh, for tens that. of millions of, of homes. Yeah, no, yes. of I mean, we're renting out millions of DVDs every month, which is, you know, crazy. Um, it is an amazing source of first data because we have all these registered users. Uh, you know, they got to swipe their credit card. They have to, we've got 40 million members in our perks program. Um, it is, uh, obviously it has, 34,000 locations around the country. So relationship with all major retailers, uh, which opens great, you know, opportunities on the ad side as well, because now we can start building, you know, 360 uh, programs uh, with them. And then the actual screens that we have on those kiosks, in addition, you know, in, in addition to the uh, screens people interact with, added TV, you know, TVs on top of the kiosks. Yeah, and it's funny. I was going through your notes to me before this panel and you had uh, uh, out, uh, digital out of home, D-O-O-O-H, right. so uh, which by home. the way is not an acronym I knew. I thought you were just like pulling a Homer Simpson and saying nope, but you weren't. You were saying digital <laughs> out of home. The fastest growing business right now, right in the ad business. So digital out of home and retail media networks are really and and the kiosk are really at the intersection of both. So because um, well, people are going back out, they're leaving their homes and they're going back out into the world after a lockdown. And so digital out of home advertising is really exploding. Right. Amanda, I'm, I'm, as someone who has been both a scholar and a student of this industry for some time and written extensively, so you've done all this research, going back, the first time I read your stuff was, I think, 2011. Um, and so really, you know, now over a decade of research and writing about this industry and you zoom out and you look at those consumer inputs that we just looked, went through, right? And then you hear the two different models from NBC Universal and from Chicken Soup for the Soul and you look across all the model remodeling that's happening right now. Just I'm interested in, in, where, in, in what you think of the shape of the ecosystem and whether or not the media ecosystem is actually meeting the demand of the moment, or if perhaps the two, the consumer and the providers are kind of passing each other as ships in the night. And to be honest, as of late, I'm most concerned that video is about to redo all of the mistakes of print of the first decade of the century. Uh, the massive amount of fragmentation in, in audiences and ad products and the extent to which that then makes it impossible for these companies to afford to produce content. I mean, I think it's, it's a flip answer, but so much of this, the answer is it depends, right? The value proposition of chicken soup for the soul versus different parts of, of what NBC Universal is doing it depends. Uh, different viewers want different things, have different price point stresses. Um, and, and what makes it even harder is that those, those move around. Um, you know, sometimes you know, certain kinds of content, maybe you'll take the ads, other kinds of content you want um, to, to have a very specific environment. Uh, I think one of the questions that I had uh, from Matt is, is all the content the same in all of those places? And, so, and, and that starts to get tricky, but eh, just looking recently at, at the, the ad market overall, um, and, and the, the first edition of the television will be revolutionized, Rev, Rev, and I was sending that in in 2005, and I remember very specifically that. Oh, that's right. 2007 was when it was published. Yeah, right? the, 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 the word then was addressable is coming next year uh, for TV. <laughs> and, and I'm a little afraid that you know, that was before social uh -huh. and that we've miss that moment for advertisers because the thing is the addressable we, moment we, or the the moment where we fix what consumers dislike about advertising uh the, the addressable moment because the the targeting that targeting would be the answer i think yeah they wanted some targeting but now we're in a universe where there's nothing but targeting and there's no mass and i just don't see the numbers lining up to be able to support content production um, with particularly meaning, the big Meaning players. that this, so when you refer to the, for what happened to print in the early part of this century, first of all, we mean this century, the 21st, um, but uh, um, secondly, you mean the uncoupling of it all, the unbundling of it all to, into the ecosphere where everybody could get it kind of everywhere and everybody had to chase the, the, the numbers. Um, so 
you you see that the moment being passed, meaning the, the, the moment where we could contain all of the revenue that the ecosystem produced in sub, the combination of subscription and advertising, we've let it all leak out. It's going to be very hard to recontain it in a way that has a meaningful bottom line for the people who publish. Is that what you're trying to say? Right. That that when and it's far more complicated than this, but that critique that gets thrown at, at the newspapers for they shouldn't have put it all out for free. Uh, <laughs> And I think with with the pivot to video yeah. or with what's happening, that's in video, what a lot of people are doing now. Yeah, you you can do that with your catalog, but that to create an appetite for professionally produced content for free or only ads, because the ad dollars are not what they were going. They're not. But to be all. fair, hasn't YouTube been doing that for for some time? And I, I do want to turn this to Jonathan, who who. So, so where Amanda kind of has the the, the real bird's eye view because she's looking at it without any kind of uh, affiliation with a, a publisher or a platform and doing it from an academic standpoint, Jonathan is in it with a bunch of different players in the ecosystem building apps for them. And he does have a vested interest in their success. So I think you share some of the concerns that Amanda is bringing up. Is that true, Jonathan? Yeah, 100%. I think that the concept of mass is key here because at the end of the day, we're talking about high quality content because YouTube has you know the two ends, right? The end of the the creator content, which doesn't necessarily mean it's low quality, but it's normally low cost to produce, so it could sustain itself on a more incremental revenue model versus studio productions that are expensive um, that need to 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 amount to some kind of bottom line, indeed. And and with programmatic ads or targeted ads, it's very hard. Um, unless you're the extra large, right? So, so Matt has YouTube. The, uh, well, YouTube, but I, I'm I'm imagining even Matt sits at uh, you know at, at that point where he can say, okay, this is meaningful to us. This actually can propel a business. But our customers are normally kind of large, medium, small, so they could come from the size of a sports team, even if it's a big sports team, or a or a or a yoga service of of what whatnot or, or, like a, or a print organization who does a lot of video or print, and, you know the independent of the uk is a customer of ours yep. and we have and we have so it's a well-known national brand and we have you know some of the disney channels are on our and it's very hard to get that mess so then you really have to engage in other models uh in order to, to and in those cases you're you're suggesting to lean into models that have the consumer driving so either through through subscription or other kinds of purchases, the the subscriber or the user is really driving the economics versus the eyeballs and the impressions because there's the combination of you don't necessarily have enough scale to compete, but then on the flip side, you're you're disturbing the experience for the consumers you do have, and therefore threatening that as well. Is that part of the point of view that you're? Well, that, table that, that could be a solution to the problem. I don't think it's the only one. I think that you can also lean deeper into the eyeball model and be more targeted in your sales, more uh, deliberate in how you sell your audience. So you have to categorize it in a, in a good way, package it and figure out where who would pay a premium for this kind of uh, audience or this kind of content. And then those are matches that that work well. I think other ways are to find different types of commercial partnerships. Uh, very much like, um, you know, I think uh, when, Philip was when Philip was talking about selling the content to an aggregator, that has been the model on cable for a very long time. So big channels like the Viacom channels have made, you know, they made their fame and fortune by selling the bundle to cable companies. And when that model started to break up and to Amanda's point, TV everywhere tried to slow this down. Uh, models of authenticated with cable that try to slow it down from a technology vantage point. We support all those models, um, but it wasn't effective enough. It was too hard for the users to engage with. It didn't create the masses. The TV uh, executives became antsy that they're losing the audience and they have to be there because of YouTube and so forth. And also Google was very effective because they gave them huge minimum guarantees, a la my idea of find ways that aren't reliant on eyeballs. So they kind of... So when you talk about brand partnerships, you're talking about marketing partnerships or or larger upfront guarantees that kind of, you know, th there's a DoorDash Roku partnership that just, uh, I don't know exactly what the economics of it are, but I imagine there's some kind of co-marketing uh, partnership that's built into that as a way to make 
get both money, both parties, more users for a longer period of time and generate more income for both. Um, Smriti, I do want to ask you a question about, so, so Amanda mentioned something about targeting. We actually had one question about personalization of ads in our survey. I didn't pull a slide up, um, but it, but it showed that, you know, the, the overwhelming majority of users either didn't care about personalization or actually liked personalization. Is that, am I getting that data correct? Correct. Yeah, absolutely. That was very shocking, at least for the fact that, you know, every company has invested so much in last few years about personalization of things that they do. But, you know, when we did the study, 54% of the people really didn't care about personalization of ads. At they, all. Had no preference. At all. Yes. Uh, only 35% actually, 35% um, didn't like personalization and 11% liked personalization. So vast majority of the people didn't care you know, they will watch ads when they want to, they won't watch ads, but they didn't care about personalization, which was shocking. And, uh, yeah. And to me, Matt, uh, I throw that to you. I mean, I know you're, you're involved both in the distribution part, but you also have to think about the ad split and all the, that mm -hmm. advent inventory. Cause that's a, you know, to, to Jonathan and Amanda's point, that's a huge part of the economics that you have to consider as you're going out there. Do, when you think about, you know, obviously personalization and programmatic, not necessarily the same thing, but when you think about person, personalization and the vast majority, 60 plus percent, either liking personalized ads or not caring one way or the, the other, do you go beyond that and say, okay, so how do we, how do we further the experience to personalize it for the consumer? But then also, are there other new commerce or other economic benefits on the other side of that? Yeah, I think that's, yeah. So I think on the, on the targeting piece, you know, that is precision targeting is a, is a big sort of part of our offering, but the other part of the offering is really scale, right? Like we're available in all of these households, whether it's on traditional televisions, connected devices, phones, tablets, you know, you kind of name it. And that's, that's, a, so that's a big part of our offering. Right. Um, and, you know, the other piece is making it easier for buyers to sort of transact on our inventory. So there's, you know, a lot that goes into it um, on sort of the offering piece, but on the personalization side, in addition to like the data and the, catering an ad to an individual user, there's all these sort of enhancements or improvements where we can use the opportunity from an advertising perspective to delight the consumer, right? Things like pause ads or things like, um, you know, where, where we can really sort of- What's be, a pause ad? Uh, so if you if you happen to pause your, your TV and want to go get a drink or something like in, in that background, you sort of get a, a branded experience slate, if you will, uh, which is- uh, uh, which is an ad, an ad spot effectively. And then when you sort of unpause, you get back. Into well, that's, screen. I mean, that's an interesting new technique to basically avoid the disintermediation of advertising. So you're, I've hit pause for whatever reason, because I'm answering a phone call or I'm getting yep. something from the fridge. Yep. And then, I mean, it's kind of like the first screen experience. Samsung takes a tremendous amount of advantage of that. Yep. I don't think Roku takes nearly enough advantage of it to be blunt. I think there's a tremendous amount of real estate that's unsold there for that first screen. Um, but you're using the pause screen as a, as a, an interesting way to add dollars to, and it's a personalized ad. So it's, yeah. it's a, it tends to fit the environment that the consumer is watching it too. Yeah. And everything sort of around, you know, and then you sort of think about like scarcity, you know, the, the traditional television model has a lot of advertising per hour, you know, could we do less on, on a peacock experience to really... do less charge more? Yeah. yeah. That's a... so there, there's a lot of that. And then in terms of like just new distribution models in general, you know, thinking outside of video, you know, we're focused on, uh, commerce uh, as a as a product where we can sort of add a shopping experience directly in uh, in line with the video itself, which is proving to be uh, a pretty successful venture for us so far. We've got a partnership with Anzu, which is a gaming company where we're doing in-game ads now, which is really interesting for us. Um, so I think we're we're really looking to innovate in in this space quite a bit for sure. So yes, going beyond sort of the the traditional you know targeting or personalization. And, and Philippe, you not only sell across all your own platforms, you rep other third-party smaller platforms than yourself. Is that that's right? Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. And that answers the, the the question about scale. Because if you're not one of the top five or six media groups, um, you do suffer from from lack of scale, uh, including for programmatic sales. You know, which seems very easy. You connect the pipe, and you think you're gonna get all that revenue. But no, uh, there's absolutely uh, you know a scale issue. Um, and so we have kind of led the uh, the the, the group of independents of, you know, independent streamers and create this uh, alliance of, we're about 16 now, 16 companies uh, that we work with and and help um, group together their, their supply and, and go to clients. And I would say, you know, 
what what is the key for us is uh, actually not programmatic or addressable t TV, which is very important, obviously, but it's our direct sales efforts and the ability to sell beyond just uh, the, the programmatic pipes, um, doing uh, brand integrations into content, which is uh, really solve some one of the issue of you know producing original content for for a company that is not a multi billion dollar media group. Um, and uh, and sponsorships and building really much closer relationships with with brands uh, with with agencies and and we've seen a lot of success with that and and that translates in, into you know criminal media spend as well um, and the more we can um, share these capabilities with other independent players you know the bigger we are and stronger we are together. And 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 um, this is for you and Matt. I know the answer for Matt because he they own local affiliates and they have you know local presence around uh, the country. Do you look? You can get down to the ISP level uh, uh, addressable ads. Yeah, so you can you can localize ads by DMA and by zip code. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course. Um, which I, I mean, I think there's this there there's this major. So 2024 is going to be a major year for the television ecosystem. Money is going to move dramatically out of linear and other areas into CTV. And one of the major drivers of it is going to be the national election in 2024. The, the Olympics in Paris in 2024 is going to be huge for NBC. Um, it's going to drive a tremendous amount of revenue across the ecosystem. But the the, the presidential election in the US, which is going to build throw a trillion dollars to the ecosystem, most of it local is really going to force flood the pipes in a way that I think is going to be important. I think useful. Ultimately, it's going to flush a lot of the garbage out of there as well. Um, but as we rebuild this ecosystem, Rachel Dreyfus has a question in the Q&A, and, and I, it's, it's perfectly for built for Amanda and Jonathan, so I'll give it to Amanda first, which is, can you compare our consumer value in the streaming model today or as it's going compares to that in the cable TV bundle model. So how does the how does the consumer value, the consumer proposition compare between those two, um, especially as, as SVOD players are stacking up all these services like we talked about earlier, where do you, where do you see the consumer fitting or at least how do, how do the two compare themselves as far as a value proposition for the consumer? It, the, the answer is very different whether you're looking at it from a consumer versus an industry perspective. And I think a lot of the pressure that's been coming from Wall Street has been assuming that we can recreate what we had with multi-channel. But the truth is that that consumer situation was dreadful. Oh, you know, the consumer was hostage the, and, and it happened no other place on earth. Um, and the I and, and it Meaning was no other territory had the same model, basically. No, no, there was competition. Um, and and you didn't the choice wasn't pay a whole bunch of money for one thing or nothing. Right. And so I think we need to recognize that that those were incredible days for the industry and those who were able to make a lot of bank on them, you know, good for you. But to try to think that that is something that we're ever going back to is, is to mistake reality. And so the fact that consumers can move around and have so many different services that I, I know the frame is often in terms of competition, but there's a lot of complementarity as well. And, and that ability what does that word to mean? I've never uh, heard of that word. But. They go together, right? Got it. Like, uh, you get out of the, or yeah, I know. And you, complimentary? The, complimentary. Okay. Like I'm it sorry. It, right? So yeah, yeah, Netflix right. with the global content complements a local SVOD, let's say, if you're right, in a Right, So those two things America. are compatible. So they, they serve as your, as the consumer's own bundle. Basically. Right. And or so at this point, maybe broadcasting, I know that a lot of sports has moved off in the US, but broadcasting TV is is sports. And if that's where you if that's what you want, you can get that there. If you want your drama, streaming services are good for that. Right. So we, it's not one or the other. It's nothing. But not do you and I will ask you this and I'll actually uh, think about this as Jonathan answers this. Is there a room for a new bundle, though? I mean, it, on the one hand, it was terrible. For the consumer. On the other hand, it was great because <laughs> I knew all of it was available for me all of the time. And yeah, I, the, the the cost went through the roof and got unreasonable. And um, there's many different reasons for that, especially since you're forced to take all these channels as, as a group. But there is people don't buy single eggs. 
right? They don't buy single cigarettes. They buy, you know, a dozen eggs and a carton of cigarettes. And there's a reason for that. There's an economy of scale, but there's also the convenience factor. So Jonathan, do you see us being able to kind of put some of those eggs back in the basket to ruin that terrible metaphor um, and, and, and figure out a way that, that the, the consumer gets the economies of scale. And, and it's really, again, the ease of use. I think there's a, there's, I think the consumer is realizing how difficult, what a pain in the ass choice act, ultimate infinite choice is. And there's a ton of science that says the more choices they have, the, the fewer, the more choices a consumer has, the few choices, the fewer choices they actually make. So Jonathan, do you see an assemblage? I mean, you work with a lot of smaller players, like you said, would a bundle of those services at a lower cost and ease of use work for consumers? Or are we, to, to Amanda's point, is that genie completely out of the bottle? Well, first of all, there are a bunch of bundles today. So it, it definitely exists. Um, and I think that some are more effective than other. And I think it goes back to UX um, in a way because it's ease of use and you know there's price and user experience and some marketing that also goes into it or a lot of marketing that goes into it. Um, and so if we unpack that, I mean, if you look at the Disney bundle that goes from Hulu and ESPN, and so that's a big bundle that has ports. So lowest churning, lowest churning SVOD in, in all of uh, streaming. Well, also because it's also bundled with Verizon and then it's, the numbers are skewed by having it free with every unlimited 5G package that you buy with Verizon. So I, I don't use it because they it's ad-based and I want to pay the premium. So I'm not even using it, but I am subscribed for Verizon and not paying. And I also get my Paramount through Walmart Plus, which I get for free through my Amex Platinum. And I also am a, am a Peacock subscriber that I get through my streaming rebate from Amex Platinum. I get the twenty dollars back, so I get that for free. So there's a lot of like that's a really that's a really out. great lineup of of existing bundles that are already out in the ecosystem that I don't even really necessarily factor in when I start thinking about bundles. So kind of like everybody came out with a mega service, and then my kids all want all these services because that's on this and this is on that and the others on there. And I don't love this model, but the only one that I'm actually really paying real people dollar for is Netflix. Because it's the center of the, it's the de facto, everybody has to have it, things still. Uh, and then all the others, I I kind of get from free from all around, except for Hulu, which I pay extra for. So there is a lot of bundling happening. And also in our customer base, um, there are passport services, right? And TV Everywhere was kind of a first passport service here in the US. And I'm assuming that because of the time, most of our audience is in the US. But if we have audience in Europe that's interested in what's happening there. Australia. Well, it's not that similar. I mean, because there are, are there's a lot of free content in a model that really goes from linear from the old days to the new days and translated more one to one. It didn't disintegrate in that way. Here in the US, it all all changed. So our customers are actually engaging in passport services, trying to see if I could have one subscription for several apps. Right. So it goes between different aspects of our long tail service um, and it more resembles the packages that you could buy on cable. So that thing, I think, is so coming the tier, back. The tier. The tier. Yeah. Right. So if I, you had the Viacom bouquet, so because Viacom is so big, then they moved that all to be Paramount Plus. But smaller customers who have value in fragmentation, also because of, uh, of the way they sell targeted ads or sponsorships or integrations, because it's beneficial to have a portfolio of services, you can have uh, one for all um uh bundling and 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 to matt's point on on the ad break and the way that the ux is played ux plays a huge role here so we see from our numbers it makes a huge difference if a user has to log in with a username and password on a smart tv or if you have a qr code using an auth device flow authorization flow grant and then you do that that and even now going to magic links um, so you don't even have to do any login. You just get an email and you click a button. So talking about how you lower the bar and make it seamless, it's very important. And we have to remember, you mentioned before, and I think in our previous conversation, you, met, you we talked about Roku and Samsung being such a big market share. We have to remember that Samsung, people that are listed in those numbers are people that just bought the TV set and it's there and it's connected to the internet. It doesn't count how many people actually logged in and downloaded one single app on their own and expanded their, their, their platform beyond what was pre-bundled. And my suspicion, more than suspicion, I don't have any exact number, but I think we all agree that that number is dramatically lower than the amount of people registered as users of the platform. Unlike Roku, because when you buy a Roku stick, you actually express your intent to use it 
to download apps and to be part of yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 the connected television doesn't necessarily mean it's being used as such. Um, okay. But when you look at the streaming numbers, Samsung got into it, Roku got into it very early, Samsung got it into it very early. And as first movers, they gained a lot yeah. of advantage just from pure usage. But you're right. I mean, Roku's, the, the, you should look at the streams versus the, the devices available. Um, well, and think I think about that's these- Sorry, when you think about these bundling packages and lowering the bar, it becomes that much more important to lower the bar on the platforms that are harder to operate. So I think that, that plays. Yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, we should all have a, a UX that is not hard to operate. <laughs> ultimately, we should all be striving to have the best and easiest UX to use. And I want to, I want to do, uh, little, Jonathan, just a quick question. Do you have kids under the age of 12? Yeah, I have twins. They're nine. Boy and girl. Yeah, so I do think that has a lot to do with Netflix being part of your unbreakable bundle right now. I don't think necessarily that translates as into homes that don't have kids under the age of in their in the under the teenage years because the 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 and I want to throw this to Smriti. You you talked about the ninety three percent of subscribers being at risk every month. So only seven percent so they're sticking with. Um, you know, as we dive into those numbers, this it does seem to say. Services that provide utility. Jonathan mentioned, you know, bundling it with a mobile service. That's a, that is a great example of utility. But so is news and sports. So having something that you need to watch on a daily basis. Was that your takeaway from from that larger survey about you know people's intentions on cutting the you know cutting a service off? I think so. Yeah. I mean, bundling definitely helps. I mean, the fact that uh, I mean, we all have seen an example of uh, Thursday night football with Amazon. I mean, trip whatever nine percent increase in this in their subscription with that flow. So sports, I think, is definitely one um, key factor that is coming up with bundling is helping drive uh, drive the subscription model. I mean, news is something. News is, was was the only one. Uh, even if you remember, news was the only one that people were thinking should be always free, and can be accompanied was very welcomed with ads because news is something that everybody has rights on. But sports was the one that everybody was willing to pay irrespective of the household, irrespective of the uh, age groups. They were all willing to invest in uh, sports. Yeah, I throw this open to the to the field. What to do about news? I mean, ultimately, Matt, I think uh, NBC and the and the other major broadcasters are having real good fortunes with uh, local and national fast channels uh, from their news divisions right now. So that kind of reinforces what Smitty was just was just saying. Um, but what do you do? Like, let's back up and say we were running Disco Brothers right now. What do you do with CNN? Do you, do you just make it free and put it out in the ecosystem and have that kind of be a Barker channel? Um, you know, Philippe, you said it, having having a piece of content out for free also helped the the the, the pay version of it. Um, does news belong for free and ad supported on the front end of a lot of services? Um, because it, it's one of those things that you have to check out daily. Um, you know, whether locally or nationally, just to you know to see what the the weather is to a certain extent. But sports, local weather, or news. Um, it, and generally, other uh, otherwise speaking, what kind of utility programming do you think will keep people um, watching or subscribed? So, because it's not only about subscription, it's also about coming back for your for your lesser priced services as well. Matt, I'll throw that open to you because I threw a lot out there, and I mentioned your fast services. So, yeah, yeah, I think you, you hit the nail on the head in terms of it's not just about subscription revenue. There is the engagement that's so required to maintain. This model, right? So that not only do they not churn out, but they're also watching content. So that we're sort of um, continuing to capitalize on the ad experience, and ad opportunity. Um, you know, news like you mentioned, we've got uh, NBC News now, which is which is really our sort of move into sort of digital native. Um, you know, twenty four seven news streaming content. And that's and free. That that that's free and, and yep. streamed via fast. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's effectively a fast channel. Um, so you know that's been and that lives inside Peacock and lives on other fast channel yep. fast platforms as platforms, well. Platforms. Yep. So we've distributed that pretty widely. Um, so even even now, post the change in the pay model. If consumers come to Peacock, they'll they'll be able to get NBC News now for free, and yeah. then look at their paywall for the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That to me feels like a really good gateway product, you know, to, to kind of ease the consumer in for something you know that they want and that they're fine watching ads in and it is scalable. And then you ease them into the paywall later. Philippe, I'm, I'm curious as to your point of view on yeah, that. Yeah, we do well, have you a- don't necessarily. 
You have yeah, what? we don't use uh, channels on the on the Redbox uh, Fast platform. For example, I don't think necessarily consumers are downloading the the Redbox app to watch local news, but it is a service, right? It's something that they can uh, they can consume. I mean, to to come back to the to the bundle conversation, I think TV OEMs are for consumers a new bundling mechanism, right? Because it really depends which TV you buy, right? If you buy whatever brand of TV, or it could be even like a Roku TV now, but um, you're gonna you're gonna find a, a built-in offering uh, for free. I mean, it's like having cable for free, and and I think it empowers the consumers to actually then select uh, what they want to pay for uh, because they already have so much uh, available for free, and um, and so that is important for people like you know com companies like us because they actually are more likely to need our content uh, because they you know of the content war gardens they may not have access to some of the big studios. Uh, content, uh, so that's in the in the an opportunity for for independent uh, programmers and and streamers to have their content uh, distributed, but also promoted. Um, and I think you're going to see more and more of them producing original uh, content and becoming the fast, the fast platforms, the fast, yeah, and uh, or Avod, right? Uh, because Vizio, Samsung, they're all in the Avod business as well. Isn't that cost prohibitive? Let me ask you a question. Don't you find that cost prohibitive? I mean, you look at Roku's earnings call yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and their revenue was flat on quarter on quarter, but up for the year, up 20% for the year, but their net income dropped like a stone, almost entirely driven by content costs. So it is, it, but I mean, look at the SVOD platforms and how much money they're losing. Yeah. So, yeah. That's yeah the true. cost of content is a problematic for everyone in the ecosystem. And I think, uh, you you got to be nimble. You, you definitely do. Have you to. see that shifting as the as as Amanda talks about the the unbundling of this ecosystem and and the kind of leaking out of a lot of the economic underpinning of it. Do you see the cost per hour of content reversing itself in the because it's really been astronomically ballooning. I think it's up more than a thousand, maybe close to fifteen hundred or two thousand percent since House of Cards. Well, the, so if you the, just look back to 20 to 12 and you look at the cost per hour of content that we watch, it's just crazy astronomical now. Do you see that now that kind of things are reshaping themselves, the, the cost of hour per content going in the other way? And you're kind of yeah. uniquely situated to have an opinion on this. I mean, you know, our cost of content is so low compared to, um, you know, the, the, the big, big guess. But the, think about it as a as an ecosystem wide, what you're selling to other third party, because you make high end premium stuff that you do sell to Netflix and some of the other premium. Yeah, we sell players. to Disney Plus, we, we sell to uh, uh, Prime. And and uh, and so that's uh, one of the- Do you see problems. that? Do you see the economics- changing on scripted and, and they, long form content? Back. There's no question that they're coming back. Uh, you know, they're shutting down series and uh, they're becoming, not, I wouldn't call it nimble, but they're, they're definitely uh, spending less billions of dollars in, in content. And is and that then, money coming out of the ecosystem or is it redirecting into things like sports rights? It's a good, yeah, sports, good question. Sports, sports, <laughs> sports rights, you know, price keep increasing, right? Everywhere around the world. That's something that's global. And that is uh, driving most of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, marketing uh, efforts from, from those platforms. So there's no question about it. But I do think that it opens up uh, an opportunity for uh, uh, TV OEMs and uh, their homegrown, you know, platforms and to become more competitive and, uh, and offer uh, maybe not the same high value original series, but content that matters more maybe to consumers. It's interesting. So you watch again and go back to your books as kind of the, the the rings of the tree of my experience in television, Amanda. And you you chart very well in your first book the evolution from broadcast, actually from radio to broadcast to um, to cable, and then in series, uh, subsequent books to streaming. Um, do you do you think the consumer? In the continuum of the consumer's mindset over the the age of television, do you think OEMs as my provider is something? I know Roku feels like a different kind of animal in the minds of the consumer. Do you think people are going to say, "Hey, I'm watching my TV channels from LG or Vizio or Samsung"? I know that's happening organically, but do you do you really see them replacing those brands in the minds of the consumer with you know uh, 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 replacing the old school television brands like? HBO and and Cam, Comcast and Charter. No, not unless they're creating content. And they're still the vehicle somewhere. We just uh, we're processing a. We did a nationally representative survey here, and we asked. That's Australia. 
Australia, sorry. Um, and we ask, what is your most valued channel or service? And the answer here is Netflix. And I think I think what gets tricky is that the US market is really specific. And at least some of these businesses are based on scale that can really take advantage of traveling globally. But the game is just a little bit different everywhere because of what the underlying system was, what were the underlying, what did people hate about television before? Maybe they didn't even realize. Um, and it's a little different in, in other places. And what you can get, you know, you're asking about news and I'd say, well, in, in, in a lot of democracies, there's this thing called public service television um, that works really well and uh, provides we a lot of service here. in real news. Um, and so I, I think understanding what works in the US market and the businesses that can succeed on that alone versus the opportunities that exist globally and how to make transnational work. And it's it's not a matter of being a mass provider in every country probably, but yeah, there, there are a lot of opportunities there that I think are being overlooked because of an effort to try and make sense of the world based on the competitive dynamics of the US. And and uh, although I will say, and I'm I'm speaking to the EBU in May, you know, I don't know that the economics underpinning those public broadcasters is going to last forever either. I mean, there is some sensitivity to that that revenue model amongst certain members of certain parliaments and certain territories. So I do think the reliance on the on the public tax as a way to fund your channel may be something to start reconsidering, simply because you can't depend necessarily on your government to do the same thing it's always done, even if that thing makes sense. Um, Smriti, um, my question to you is, you know, when you think about the mind of the consumer, and, and we did ask them across not just video, but audio and gaming and other channels as well, are there other forms of bundles? I mean, Jonathan mentioned bundling mobile and video and Amex bills, you know, uh, and video. And, and those seem to have worked really well from a retention standpoint. I don't know how well they work from an economic standpoint, but forgetting, pretend you don't have to worry about the economics, you're just a packager. When you look at the answers people have with regards to the services that they value and how they value them, do you see a different form of bundle that, that might serve as a retention mechanism for consumers on a moving forward basis? I think the two other areas that came out across uh, apart from sports was gaming and music. I mean, music is something that ties the younger audience very well. And that's something, you know, I mean, I know Apple is working on this. So, you know, that's definitely an area that can bind and have a long term uh, value for the customer and more of a younger generation uh, leading towards it. Yeah, and and having worked on a couple of music fast channels with Warner Music Group, I can say just based on the data that music is actually a really successful genre and fast. Uh, I'm curious, Matt and and Philippe, whether you've looked into cross partnerships or content based on you know lifestyle products like music or gaming. I know Matt, you mentioned you're getting into a bit of the gaming business, but just for kind of a future looking audience standpoint, when you look at Gen Y and especially Gen Z and Gen A, do you do you see yourself getting into these genres, not just as an opportunity to, to, to make money off of, but also as a kind of, hey, can we recruit these new audiences into our ecosystem that we don't yet have? I'll to go to Philippe first. Um, yeah, I mean, we have, uh, also fast channels uh, in, the, in the music uh, category, uh, certainly. Um, I can't say that it's been a, a strong focus for us. I mean, we're still very much in movies and TV, TV shows, uh, but it is interesting, I think, to see who we can partner with, uh, certainly, and, and, and co-market, co you know, do co-marketing uh, programs. And we have, we have a few of those, not necessarily with gaming companies today, but we are exploring that. So that thing that... Uh, let me ask you a question because this came up for Faiz, uh, uh, Habib asked in, in the Q&A, because you, you look across uh, not only a slate of fast channels, but you also look uh, across a slate of uh, partner channels who you sell, and then you have your own slate of channels. Do you see a migration within the, the free or even TVOD ecosystem, but let's concentrate on free for a second, away from what was at first kind of a, a, a land grab or a gold rush to get real estate on fast and wasn't necessarily always the best quality to an ecosystem that seems a little bit more or, or appreciably more focused on quality. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I think 
it comes from the fact that the big studios are actually now creating fast channels. And even those who um, swore a year ago, they would never ever put Netflix. some of the yes. shows on, on a free channel. And they are. <laughs> and they are now syndicating those channels. And not only to the big, big platform, but they're looking to be everywhere. So I think there is definitely an opportunity for fast platforms to keep upgrading the, the quality of the content. And, and you are seeing the small early players even who... Um, I, I wouldn't say got lucky, but we're early entrants, you know, years ago, we we're getting kicked out uh, because the, of the quality. They just uh, can't keep up in the quality anymore. Yeah, Jonathan, that is that your your point of view? Or is, is that what you're seeing across the spectrum as well? Kind of this yeah. migration towards a higher quality kind of pound for pound? For sure. And, and, and actually, interesting when we talk about music, it, it made me think of one of the reasons that a lot of our customers like to have music is because it opens up the realm for background uh, streaming, which is a huge revenue opportunity that's on top yeah. because when you have a mobile device, there's so much competition when you're watching the video on the screen, you get a text message, you get a call, you get an email, there's another thing, there's social networks. But when the phone is in your pocket, actually, and your Air AirPods are in your ear, something like that, there's a lot less competition. It's not that it doesn't exist. So streaming that, and we've seen customers create a significant lift in their um, in-stream ads and like and revenue through background behavior. And news is kind of the other superpower. It actually all ties into the question on bundling because there was this big trend. We have broadcasters that had sports news and entertainment and they wanted to break it out because they wanted right. to write right. you act for each one. NBC did that for you know, NBC News, NBC Sports, and, um, and NBC.com, they were different properties. Sports, we all know, like the behavior, it's very expensive. It brings a lift. And if you're really good at what you do, you keep your users after the Olympics or after the World Cup or whatever. But news and music are super interesting because music does that background thing, which increases engagement. And news uh, increases retention because of the daily habit of it. So push notifications. Well, but, but I, I, would, I would also argue the music does the daily habit too. I mean, who, how many people here know people who listen to their Spotify kind of every single day? And there is a way to replicate that kind of on this, and, and it's happening. I mean, Vivo has made a whole business off of, of, of basically everything Jonathan is saying, which is being background. Matt, do you, do you, have you played around in that, in that space at all? Or how do you see music or gaming playing into a younger audience as you move forward? Yeah, not a ton similar to Philippe, um, where you know, we're, we're really focused on movies and, and television at the moment um, and just sort of getting uh, our fast sort of strategy off the ground and, and distributed widely. So that's where we've been focused at the moment. But you see the news as a kind of daily touchstone. I mean, that yeah. that, is, that that is that repetitive usage that kind of protects the the churn, yeah? For sure, yeah. Cool. Well, I, I see Eric, which is my sign to shut up. Um, I had a good time. I don't care about anybody else. Uh, you guys were great. Um, very good conversation. Didn't have to look at my notes once, um, which is either good or bad. Um, but thank you so much, uh, Eric, for having me. Thank you, panelists, for being so awesome. And Thanks thank for... you, Evan, and all the panelists. I think everyone had a good time. Uh, and it also thanks again to Signiant. Uh, for sponsoring all of Streaming Media Connect and Applicaster for sponsoring this session. Going back to name that tune, the music you heard at the beginning was James Brown's Soul Pride Parts 1 and 2. Luke Wu nailed it right away. Nice job, Luke. And watch your email for your Amazon gift card later in the week. We'll be back at 1 p.m. Eastern when Andy Howard will be joined by speakers from LinkedIn, EY, IBM, and Lockheed Martin to talk about moving beyond corporate communications and training. See you then.